आफ्टरनून एवरीवन इंटरेस्ट इंटरेस्टिटी वर्कशॉप इन दी पोस्ट Right. So, the idea through this workshop is try and redefine our understanding and the obesity care. Uh, session is supported by known contracted for the future. Um, and we'll be having two talks uh, on the effects of weight loss on cardiovascular factors in type two diet, followed by Dr. Om speaking defining obesity. let me start by asking all of you which obesity related complication do you encounter most commonly in your patient obesity and as this is a workshop and not just a lecture let, let's make it more interactive the show of hands let me ask you again which obesity related complication do you encounter most commonly in your patients with obesity so you can yes let's just hear some scream of words and and what you diabetes, diabetes. okay what else hypothyroidism this lipidemia osteoarthritis sleep apnea fatty liver pcos cardiovascular disease male hypogonadism hypertension right so nash yes so i think different words for the same so we 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 come across many of these right uh, however as the first answer from all of you was diabetes that's the commonest association though most other ones are now on the rise and as important so greater the bmi greater is the risk of developing type 2 diabetes that's been established through evidence and that's it's a no brainer for most of us now and this is even true even in the indian population where the general bmi would be a little lesser than our caucasian counterparts but even in our population higher the bmi higher the risk of developing type 2 diabetes and there is of course the additive risk for type 2 diabetes with obesity and and pre diabetes have 4.9 times the risk of uh, of obesity this is from a prospective study in about 4369 finnish men and women the mean follow up of of 9.4 years um So you're trying to see in patients with obesity, you're getting about a 4.9 times higher risk of developing pre-diabetes or diabetes. Um, in those who had pre-diabetes, again the progression was 6.7 times. And if you had both obesity and pre-diabetes, then 17.4 times the higher risk of progressing diabetes. So there's been a clear connect between weight and and onset of pre-diabetes or diabetes. Now obesity, pre-diabetes, and type 2 diabetes, many may consider this to be a disease continuum and a lot may argue and say that it all starts with obesity and again i come back to our population and i say though not obviously uh, uh, as 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 obese as the western counterpart we know that have a large amount of intra abdominal and and uh, visceral fat which today is stone sense considered as as obese the thin fat indian concept pretty much applies and what have we seen in our population is the evidence for you start lo looking at the the glucose values and you're looking at 2 hours post glucose load value you're looking at fasting glucose the insulin sensitivity measured through the homa uh, uh, s and the beta cell function again through the homa beta uh, you're trying to see here where are we going wrong at what point in time when you have obesity when you have the of of fatty liver disease the insulin resistance as probably as 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 precursor to to 
uh, develop problems start seeing in patients with pre diabetes there is beta cell compensation and you start seeing that in the was post glucose load that that's probably the first thing to rise and one of the clinical derivations from this is simple fact that you always ask your population with both the sugar values it's not unusual for us to come across our patients who are newly detected with diabetes today and who would say that we think every one year what sugar did you check you did only a fasting sugar very often missing the bus by not looking at the post glucose or the post meat sugar which is actually the first one to rise in your journey from uh, obesity to pre diabetes to diabetes that's when you start seeing what's happening to the profile when you develop into type 2 diabetes start seeing that your post glucose load is going up by now your fasting glucose is high and you start seeing a dip in the beta cell function as you start measuring your homa beta activities and you see beta cell output going down so all of it is a continuum you see certain changes there in obesity at the level of insulin resistance level of skeletal muscle and adipose till that time you really don't see much difference you measure the glucose values start moving towards pre diabetes and that's when you start seeing things. so obesity is a major determinant for residual cardiovascular there are some non modifiable risk factors which you can't change an individual it gender genetics and city so among the modifiable risk factors they there may be solutions to start looking at or or, or reducing the risk of obesity and i think that's important so any modifiable risk factor that you can should all try and control all of these to prevent the disease what do these risk factors contribute to well it's increase in your blood pressure increase in glucose bad lipids and inflammatory milieu hence getting the entire gamut of the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease endothelial function muscle cell proliferation you're getting more procoagulatory uh, uh, milieu there again increased chances of thrombosis increased plaque rupture and of course increased chances of events like mi stroke or peripheral arterial disease further look at the link between obesity and cardiovascular disease in patients with obesity you will have adipocyte triglyceride turnover and lipolysis which is used in individuals with overweight the normal cycle there of the turnover of adipocytes tends to get reduced will have again a lot of inflammatory cytokines being from these sites all of that contributing to worsening atherosclerosis and obesity as accelerating atherosclerosis indirectly via effects on blood pressure effect on glucose lipids uh, directly via the actions of adipokines on the vascular wall is causing the cardiovascular disease a lot of these things are for us take this for granted yes you have obesity diabetes have vascular disease but some of these mechanisms which are getting clearer over the decades also make us understand why the solution is not what you do post an event the solution actually lies much earlier understanding the pathophysiology and the origin of these complications step back trying to tackle at the level of preventing obesity or managing obesity which so today very often contribute to diabetes cardiovascular So the risk of cardiovascular events are in, with increased difference between diabetes and CMI. Here we're talking about the risk of CV events which increase CMI. Um, this both in men and women a little more pronounced in, in middle-aged men. Link between uh, overweight and and um, incidence of cardiovascular. As your BMI goes, incidence is. systematic uh, systemic inflammation sorry also increases the risk of cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes again it's it's largely because once you have obesity adipocytes because of increased calorie intake it come into a more hypertrophic adipocytes hypertrophic adipocytes as mentioned earlier soft inflammatory cytokines your il60 nf alpha 
uh, and and many more of inflammatory cytokines which lead to the entire environment or milieu of systemic inflammation what does this do well the level of the pancreas this will lead to a reduced insulin secretion there will be reduction in glucose uptake and increased insulin resistance at the level of skeletal muscle at the level of liver you have reduced cholesterol metabolism you have increased hepatic glucose output again increased insulin resistance then at the vascular level you have increased endothelial permeability more plaque development more atherosclerosis so the crux of things lies again as i am repeatedly saying in obesity diabetes leading to cardiovascular because of the change in the adipocyte structure you have this triad dirty triad of type 2 diabetes obesity and cardiovascular the question we ask now is can pharmacological weight management address the triad GLP-1 RAs and semaglutide have cardiovascular and metabolic effects. The effects of GLP-1 and GLP-1 receptor agonists. Today we know a little better about these drugs that they they will increase satiety and they they reduce the appetite through that. They increase stress. They will reduce the hunger. They'll energy intake. In terms of cardiovascular benefits, reduction in blood systolic blood pressure, reduction in lipids, reducing inflammation. In terms of its gastric effect, it reduced gastric acid causing reduction in gastric emptying and also leading to increase insulin secretion and importantly suppression of the alpha cells causing reduced glucagon secretion semaglutide which is a, a glp1 receptor agonist it has 94 homology to the human glp1 has a half life of approximate it reduces body weight and improves glucose metabolism and profile has an anti inflammatory and anti sclerotic effects and it's associated with cardiovascular benefits in type 2 diabetes cardiovascular outcome trial programs say in 6 um non inferiority in pioneer 6 and now we await the detail data from soul which is the other cardiovascular outcome trial for glp1 harness harness the effect of glp1 for its therapeutic what are the ones which we have we have liraglutide we have dulaglutide have oral semaglutide uh, but if you look at globally what's approved for specifically for obesity um, you have 0.4 mg uh, semaglutide which is ovi hopefully we get it in our country soon um, and then we have the 3 mg of liraglutide again available globally taxenda not here in india what we have is up to 1.8 mg for its approval for type 2 diabetes management to have all these three drugs are approved but in terms of semaglutide what we have in india is the oral tablet the bills is 3 7 and 40 mg to be up titrated gradually we of course have the liraglutide injectable available daily and you have your dulaglutide as one the evidence for oral semaglutide uh, you look at pioneer 1 which is uh, its monotherapy usage versus so you see reduction in hba1c it's 26 week trial um and 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 you see this reduction which is a little dose dependent though the difference between 7 mg and 14 mg in a1c reduction is not so pronounced you also see the effect on body weight and you see the mean baseline body weight here at 88.1 kg and you are getting about a 4.1 kg weight reduction in a 26 week duration with 14 mg of 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 uh, oral semaglutide just like hb a1c higher the hb a1c higher the reduction you get in phase 3 trials similar is is the um, uh, concept for weight if your baseline weight is going to be higher you're going to get higher reduction here the baseline weight was 8.1 in 26 kg you're getting about 4.1 uh, uh, kg weight reduction for bills is for what about Im improvement in the other cardio metabolic risk factors you're seeing reduction in systolic blood pressure um as monotherapy again benefit for the same when you're looking at its comparison with empagliflozin again seeing um benefits in terms of reduction or uh the the blood pressure which is if you compare that with empagliflozin 
much more pronounced. Oral semaglutide reduces systemic inflammation also by reducing the HSCRP levels and by causing reduction in systolic blood pressure. To further look at the evidence for oral semaglutide, in terms of lipid parameters, there is reduction in total cholesterol, there is reduction in LDL cholesterol, reduction in triglycerides, and, 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 and similar uh, HDL in both. TLP1 do harness the effects for its therapeutic use. Um, said earlier in terms of its benefits for both obesity and type 2 diabetes. Injectable semaglutide improvement in body weight. Now that's where the great evidence is coming in through the STEP program and that you're seeing where the baseline weight was much higher. These were the obesity trials about 105 kilograms. Benefits for injectable semaglutide of patients which achieve more than 15% weight loss. You see in these, across this step programs, 54% patients achieving more than 50% weight loss. Today, a lot of data gets presented for more than 5% weight loss. Well, the conventional belief was to look at 10%, started seeing 5% as some benefit. But then you have dlp ones today or even the other groups in the, in, in the pipeline in this they're actually showing 50 to 70, 80 percent achievers in the more than 15 percent weight loss segment. Injectable semaglutide also showed improvement in cardiovascular risk factors um, for waist circumference, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, and in reduction of inflammatory markers like the CO. Also showed improvement in other metabolic risk factors, HbA1c reduction, clearly evident, reduction in fasting plasma glucose. Um, 7.5 millimoles, 7.5 milligram fasting serum insulin down by 32.7 and triglyceride reduction by 19 milligrams. You look at the exposure response relationship for oral versus cutaneous semaglutide and it's similar. So very often the question comes up that a lot of data that we see for injectable semaglutide is it oral semaglutide and when you see the exposure response relationship in terms of drug availability for both oral and injectable Right. And the GLP-1 RACVT revealed beneficial benefits in diabetes. This is this is like a meta-analysis of all the cardiovascular outcome trials in the G. Uh, be it be it harmony, has all shown reduction in reduction of MACE, cardiovascular death, all-cause mortality. Let me summarize by saying that there is an unmet cardiovascular need in obesity. CVD is a leading cause of death worldwide. Obesity is an important risk factor. Despite contemporary evidence-based obesity have higher evidence of events, weight loss is an important aspect. And at every option or every place, you cannot always consider bariatric surgery. In fact, even in a workup for bariatric surgery or most patients who have undergone bariatric surgery and, and needing to sustain the weight loss are also offered the benefits of GLP-1. Um, CVOTs in obesity so far have been inconclusive. There is an unmet need for therapies to prevent cardiovascular risk in, in obesity. There is clear evidence for effects and mode of action for semaglutide, for its appetite regulation, weight loss, and the metabolic and cardiovascular benefits as shown in my previous slides. With that, um, introduction to the problem that we have, I now hand it over to Om to probably offer a solution.